Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, can you raise your hand if you were in the rave last night? So extra thanks for you to be, for being here. So I hope you had fun, and I hope uh, we can have fun in the next uh, 50 minutes. Uh, as the panel says, we are going to talk about who are the next billion Ethereum users, uh, and how can Ethereum positively impact their lives. Um, I'm su super privileged and honored to be here with uh, the new fellows from Ethereum Foundation. Mihailo, Mari, Joffrey, uh, and we're going to be talking about the different projects, the different motivations, why are they personally moved to be addressing this, these next billion people they think they are going to be impacted by Ethereum, and why don't we start with a round of introductions. Um, Mary, do you want to go first? Sure. My name is Mary P. Davies, and my project is the Digital Asset Perpetuity Project, and the goal of the project is to answer the question, what happens to your ETH when you die? Where are you coming from? Tell, tell us a little bit about your background, Marie. Um, I'm a legal technologist and a researcher. I have a background in compliance and law, and I did a master's thesis on basically digital assets that were things like Facebook pages and that kind of thing, and it led me to looking at digital assets that have fiat value and how to transfer those when you die. And yeah, that's basically how I, how I got to where I'm at so now. So it, it sounds that you're the kind of people that read the terms and conditions of everything, right? I do. I read terms <laughs> and conditions. Yeah, I do. Okay, and, okay, okay. And what brought you to the Web3 world? What, what brought you to DEF CON? What, how do you connect where you were coming from to this world? Well, when you start looking at the, the trouble people have with, with digital assets, like a Facebook page or their, or their email, and then you think, okay, that's, that's a problem, but it's not something that they've invested tens of thousands of dollars in that suddenly disappears when they die. I mean, right now we have no process for transferring our digital assets when we die. And as the value goes up and the popularity goes up, that's going to become a bigger and bigger problem. It sounds like an opportunity there, yeah. I think Thank so. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Geoffrey, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, so my name is Geoffrey. Uh, I'm a co-founder at a Y Combinator-backed startup called Poco. Um, and I think for me, how I'm involved um, as a fellow in the Ethereum Foundation uh, is that I've been looking a lot at how we can better uh, get regulators to interact with Web3 technology and to learn and understand not just the technology that we have here, uh, but also the culture that we have around decentralization and how they can build better policies uh, that, that the intersection between decentralized and centralized systems. Interesting, interesting. Actually, there was a very hot conversation about regulations right now before the panel started. Geoffrey, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Are you an engineer? Are you, yeah, can you tell us a little so, bit more? So I kind of took a almost like accidental journey into the regulation and policy making process. I actually start out, um, I got first introduced to uh, Bitcoin in 2012 when I was in MIT uh, doing research. Uh, and then I was working on the product and technology side of things, uh, launching a protocol in 2017. Uh, and then I found myself having to work a lot more with regulators. Uh, since then, not the most fun thing to do, but very important. <laughs> um, and you know, I was yeah. actually helping the central bank in Singapore um, uh, kind of launch their experiments around blockchain technology so they can learn and understand what's going on there. But I think my journey and interest in blockchain technology is a lot more personal. Okay. Uh, so I used to run a nonprofit that trained women entrepreneurs in an OFAC-sanctioned country. Uh, we were doing everything compliantly. Uh, and then one day the bank comes to us and they said, hey, uh, you are operating a high risk environment. We're gonna shut down your company's, uh, your nonprofit's bank account. Uh, and, and that was a huge blow to us. It took a lot of time to sort out those issues. And the worst part of it is that we didn't do anything wrong. You know, we were compliant. The bank made a business decision around the risk they had to face. And I see that problem happening again today where uh, because of the perception of regulators and the pressure from regulators, they are conflating activities that are legitimate and illegitimate, and I think vastly affecting the industry. I think that's something that motivates me to help regulators better understand what Web3 is all about. Awesome, Geoffrey. So uh, as, as Mary was introducing herself, and now Geoffrey, 
we can see that probably because we don't like to talk about that and because we don't like to talk with regulators, maybe we can find the next billion people there, right? <laughs> so, Michaelo, can you share a bit about you, your motivations, your background? Thank you, Joey. Hello, everyone. My name is Mihailo. Uh, I'm coming from the World Organization of the Scout Movement. This is where I lead the digital transformation and technological projects. So can I say hi Scouts? like this? Yeah, like this. Uh, like this? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm the Scout in the room. Um, so yeah, I'm here with the Tyrion Fellowship, uh, uh, and my project is basically about looking into how how to gear up this, the movement, educational, non-formal non, uh, non educational movement like scouting is. Uh, of 58 million members uh, in, in 220 territories uh, around the world, how do we bring them and get them ready for Web 3.0? How do we make? How do we work with young people, um, you know, and to understand the blockchain and to be the citizens of the of the, the future world? Yeah. And what what about uh, like like your your educational background? Where are, where are you coming from in that sense? Sure. Uh, my educational background is project management, okay. but then I basically all the time I was in the IT type of projects and then technological projects. Uh, I volunteered for the scouting for yeah. um, for most of my life. I was a scout and volunteered, and then um, started very early actually to work for the World Organization of the Scout Movement. First at the European level, and then later on now at the global uh, headquarters, which is now based in Malaysia for the past nine years. Awesome, awesome, love it. So we can tell that perhaps from from, and I I will try to oversimplify, so no means to disrespect. So from a volunteering kind of approach, from a legal tech approach, and from a policy making approach. Let's see and let's dig deeper into what's the next billion, what we are thinking uh, will be the next billion users for the Ethereum community. Um, Geoffrey, when, when, we, when you think or when you hear this question or, or when you join the, the, the next billion team as an Ethereum fellow, what's the persona that comes to your mind? Can you describe that person or that uh, stereotype or that uh, yeah, subject? Yeah, so um, we are doing a lot of work with the government of Kazakhstan to pilot certain uh, experiments around Web3 technology and also Web3 regulations. Um, and I think the one thing that really stood out to me was that uh, the central bank did a survey and they found that 25% of the population had exposure to crypto. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you'll see that consistent number going anywhere from 10 to 30% in most countries around the world. Uh, and I think when you think about it, there's really a population of like 70% uh, that would not have touched uh, any mm. of these technologies almost in every country in the world. So I see it as a very, very big pool of people who have not uh, had access to crypto, have not touched it. And then once you think about actual decentralized technology, because most people's their first exposure is through on-ramps, through centralized exchanges. Uh, once you think about actually say, hey, have you set up a MetaMask? Have you used any DApp? that number drops to maybe like 5%, 3%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think that's really the gap that we're trying to close uh, in a number of ways. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I love when, when these statistics come and they say like, hey, just in 2021, the crypto adoption went like 2,000%. Like, like, oh, that's a lot. But then in, just in Latin America, it's like 30 million people out of 650 million. So it represents almost nothing. There, there is a billion hidden there, right? Marie, what about you? What's, what's the persona that, that, that you think when, or that comes to your mind when you think of the next billion? Well, when I think of the next billion, I don't, I don't think of it from the perspective of a persona. I think of it more as a product. And then I think, what exactly are we selling to the next billion? And if I drill down into it, what I see is what we're selling is a trusted product and service. And if we take, if we take a step down from that, what we're selling is trust. So what we need to do to reach the next build, billion is to build the trust of our ecosystem and the, and the products and services that we make, because if people don't trust us, they won't use us. Okay, so interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to dig deeper here, but I, I don't know how to put it. <laughs> I'll come back, I'll come back to that, it will come to me. Uh, can, you, can you describe the scouts? Can you do, I, I believe that the scouts are your personas, right? Yeah, that's, that's uh, actually what I have in mind. I have in mind not just scouts, but young people, uh, yeah. the, the future. Uh, future is in them and they we talk about building trust with the regulators we talk about these challenges um, but the future regulators will be the young people of today and those those people are not foreign to these technologies and things um, for them this is all more natural more op they're op more open-minded there's less foreign less foreign for them but what we need to do uh, to to reach that uh, one next billion I think we need to work um, work with the young people, thinking of the long-term future, work, work in the presence, work now with the regulators, work with the, uh, all the stakeholders right now and the people in the room, but also 
think of the future and work with the young young generations uh, that will be the future regulators, future future users, future um, and and you know mobilizing, mobilizing more, showing to the world that. Um, Blockchain is not only about crypto, that is about doing good, that is a technology for good, and showing them what I felt here when I came first day, that this is really about everybody is in the mission of doing something good and solving some, some real life problems. So if we could build a trust by showing um, to everyone more, you know, becoming from a niche, from a niche group, as you said, yeah. that, that growth becoming a mainstream, um, the path is to really build a trust and, and make, make ourselves more open. Yeah, and, I, and I believe that the Web3 and, and, and blockchain ecosystem in general has a lot to learn about these scouts. These scouts kind of organically or naturally organize in different nodes, right? It's, it's a very interesting approach to, to see things. So I, I, I became an, an Ethereum fellow uh, during um, hard years. <laughs> this is the first time I met the, well, the Next Billion team in person. Uh, but even though we, we didn't have the time to share in person, Ethereum Foundation helped me a lot because I work with public institutions, because I want to, to teach public servants and also serve technology and also bring them into Web3 technologies and kind of get into your government portal and instead of creating a digital profile, just connect your wallet. So that kind of approach for us was, let's jump into the Web3 and let's bring institutions into the Web3. That was my approach to applying into the Ethereum Foundation and to become a fellow and to try to learn how the Ethereum Foundation can help us and how we can also help the Ethereum ecosystem. When you think of that, when you think of how you applied to become an Ethereum fellow, what's the problem you were describing with these personas? What's, what's that thing that personally moves you to be tackling or addressing or, or trying to gather these next billion people? Geoffrey, do you want to walk? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the, the big gap with um, working with regulators is that they, and policymakers is that they don't, like, you know, going back to like, the prom statement I had was that they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the technology. You ask a regulator, have they used a MetaMask? Um, none of them would have done it. Um, I just want to check, you know, in, in the audience, is there any regulators or policy makers in this audience here? Raise your hand if anyone, okay. So, so I think that's a that's We clearly example, need to right? go for them, right? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> the, it, it, you, you can't understand the culture without being here, without feeling it and interacting with the community. And the approach that we are taking uh, is to get regulators to experiment with mm -hmm. the technology. Uh, so in Kazakhstan, for example, we are working with the government uh, on two different projects. Uh, one is around uh, provision of public services. So they have a national IT park. They have a bunch of education uh, activities around it. And they say, hey, you know, if we transform this into a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, uh, what does it look? How will people use the technology? Uh, you know, what people need to, how do they open up wallets? How do they use those wallets to interact with each other? These are things that are very, very new to most people in the world. And they want to experiment and try and see, uh, to understand exactly what it is that they're dealing with here. Um, the other thing is that they are introducing a national crypto fiat rail by mandate. But then as they start doing it, they say, oh, you know, we have all these stakeholders with all these different issues. You know, how do we think about it? You know, what's happening out there? Um, and I think, Learning by doing is just so critical uh, in trying to understand the Web3 space from a policymaker perspective. Interesting, interesting. In your case, Marie, um, is there any like personal motivation that you feel that it's moving you uh, to, to, to tackle the problem that you're referring? I love how you introduce yourself and say, I am Marie, I'm working on how to, do, what will happen to your eat when you die? <laughs> so it's really good, but is, is there anything that is actually moving you towards there? Uh, is there anything you want to share on how you apply to Ethereum Foundation, how you describe this problem, and what moves you to be kind of pulling these next billion people towards the ecosystem? Well, I think that without getting all deathy. When people die, transferring assets from the individual to their estate is extremely complicated. It, it involves not only inheritance law, estate law, but contract law, privacy law, and, and it isn't as simple as just handing over the asset. And the laws are very old, and they're complicated, and they're, different jurisdictions have different laws, and in some jurisdictions, multiple laws apply. And I thought that the way to approach the problem of what happens to your ETH when you die is to, at first, build a database of all of the laws that apply across the world to transfer of, of assets on death, and then to look for patterns in those laws, and then to sort of compile that as a list of requirements, and then approach the community and say, 
These are the legal problems that we have with assets transfer on death. How do we use our technology to solve them? And that, that was the sort of driver that, that got me going and realizing that if we disrupt, what I call disrupt from within, if we look at how it works now and look at what needs to be reformed and changed and how technology can replace things like wills need a wedding signature. That's crazy. And they need to be on paper. That's crazy. I mean, we have technology that can do that without either of those requirements. But unless we know whether those, unless we understand the law enough to know that that solution will work, I think we risk having, flying in the face of disruption and, and being opposed by the powers that regulate that sort of thing rather than being accepted by them. Interesting. Um, and it, it's, it just made me think that, that when we die and when we have money in a regular bank like fiat, like for example in Mexico if you have no will and no one claims it, the bank just used this money. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Uh, but, but here when we're thinking about uh, ETH for example, it's bad for you and it's bad for the ecosystem because the ETH got locked. So yeah. the problem gets bigger and bigger, right? And that's a problem. It's a problem for an individual. But it's also a problem for our ecosystem. If, 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 uh, if digital assets are frozen or, I mean, think of a, I think of a service mm. provider that has you know, frozen ETH on his books. How do they handle that? I don't know. So, yeah, it, it is. And also, the, going back to my trust point, if, they, if we can't be trusted to transfer assets the way other assets transferred, are people going to trust ETH itself or digital assets registered on blockchain with smart contracts. So it is, it's, a, it's a multiple layer problem. Yeah, very interesting, yeah, very interesting problem. So uh, going to you, Mihailo, uh, are you thinking of an actual problem or an opportunity that, that is personally moving you to, to kind of persuade these 58 million people, you said? Yeah, 58. 58 million people to come in. Uh, so what, what are you thinking? What, what are your thoughts behind that? So. As a scouting is in a, as a scout as myself and scouting is in a mission of creating better world. We do that by creating better citizens for the future. Okay. We do that by providing them non-formal education opportunities. So bringing this other education that nobody talked about so much or is not, but it's actually bigger and in some cases also more relevant, especially in today's uh, times where education is uh, evolving. So education, uh, education, education. So it's really really about that. So personally, I am. Um, I'm on that mission, looking into how we educate more young people to, do, to use this, how we get more and more users, um, and how we, with that, spark their um, curiosity. And their, so it's not that we are giving, and this is how you do it, so go and be doer, but hey, this is how you do, how you do it, but you can think of other solution, another way to build something on this, and feel free. And how do we nutrish that community within community? So my, my goal would be to create, a, one of the things I would do in the project is to create a community within scouting that works on the blockchain. The so scouts who are interested about Web3.0 and, and blockchain and, and support their work, basically. Not, not direct them, not guide them, but just support their initiatives. And I'm thinking to do that like a DAO community as well, also within the scouting, yeah. So, um, yeah, I believe that's, that's uh, the answer for this, I think. Simple Very way. interesting. I can think about multiple things from, from digital identity. And I remember uh, Daniel Ryan sharing on the opening that, that probably the next steps for, for the Ethereum ecosystem are not going to be financial, but perhaps uh, tapping into the potential of identities. And, and I can see an opportunity here in Dallas. Um, Yep. Just one thought uh, about the debt that you mentioned, and that is you reminded me of a very important problem that we look into solving. Our, it's a big challenge of today, of course, is the uh, child abuse, uh, abuse of any kind, not just child, but anyone, adult, young people, anyone, any abuse, any, any uh, form of, of abuse. Uh, I am very interested to figure out how technology can help us in that. So, and I believe there is uh, a way it can help us. It's, it's about, yeah, I mean, partially on education, but partially also about figuring out the system and mechanisms for um, creating a safe environment for everyone. I think that's also something I'm, I'm very uh, like motivated and driven to. So that will be one of the important initiatives within scouting. Very interesting. And I, and I can see uh, the kind of the, the hard part of the motivation behind. So and that's, that's what we need to, to get the next billion, to be like purpose driven and persist. Uh, and that's going to be it. So before I jump into uh, opening questions and, and opening the floor for, for, for the audience to, to tap into different things on, uh, around your, what you have been sharing, I would love you to share where are you going or how do you think the Ethereum ecosystem can help you to reach this next billion? Uh, do you have any, any challenges in mind? Do, 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 where do you see yourself in six months from now into reaching this next billion? Jeffrey, you want to go? 
Yeah, so I think one of the issues, the, um, you know, where I see this decentralized system meeting centralized system uh, kind of bumping up against quite frequently, um, I think it's in the crypto fiat rails. And I do believe that that's still very much the core through which most new users uh, in the world will start to get access to this ecosystem. Uh, and I think it's something that there needs to be uh, ways to kind of facilitate that and make that a more seamless transition. And in many parts of the world, it's getting a lot more restrictive. You know, I go to my bank and I say, my company is dealing a lot with crypto. Uh, you know, the bank maybe says, oh, high risk customer, forget it, I'm gonna shut down your bank account. <laughs> Uh, so I think that's one area, uh, you know, I love to talk to people, you know, if they have to have to deal with these issues, especially from a um, kind of compliance side, love to engage with people to, to learn uh, about, you know, kind of the conversations they're having uh, in a confidential manner and, and you know, what, would best, uh, what can best be done to persuade regulators that there isn't the kind of risk that they imagine exists in this ecosystem. Uh, the other part I'm super excited about actually is um, gaming. I'm a gamer. Um, and I believe that actually in Southeast Asia, uh, where I live, um, I'm currently in Vietnam, um, I think games is a very, very great way to introduce a lot of people that don't have um, experience kind of uh, with this ecosystem and get them into it. Uh, even the, the DAO that we are working with, the National IT Park in Kazakhstan, it actually came out from an original thinking where they are trying to say, how do I gamify the experience and involvement of my community uh, with the infrastructure that we have. Um, and now it's extended into the Web3 space. So I think you know, that's another area that I'm just super excited about and would love to talk to people who know the Web3 gaming space uh, better than I do. Awesome, awesome. Mary, where do you see, or, or what's the obstacle, what, what's the challenges that you're seeing up front in the next six months for your project and for reaching this next billion? Well, I think in six months we'll have a database of all the law that applies to the transfer of asset, digital assets when you die. Um, going to need it. It'll be. An, I want it to be an open source database, so I'm going to need some sort of a platform to record it and make it accessible to people. And then the next step is to create the list of legal requirements for what needs to happen in different jurisdictions. And then what I'm hoping is that the community will be able to look at those and say, okay. We've got the technology to do this and this. We, we can solve this problem with a technical solution. And that, that, that's the sort of vision for the next phase of my project. Okay, interesting. What about, what about you, Milo? Do you, do you see any, any challenges there? I mean, I can, I can picture some of them, but what, are you, what, what do you see your, like your next steps for Can you share with the audience where you're going? Yeah. Sure, thanks, Jay. So, We'll start with the smaller bites, of course, and the things that will be easy and will actually be a, um, something that Scouts will be very motivated and easy going to, to accept is that we'll, of course, start creating or putting the, the Scout badges into the, uh, and uh, turning them into the NFT badges and putting them in you know, via POP and other technologies, we'll put them into, into the wallet. So we'll have Scout wallet with Scout badges. Um, so that will help Scouts bring on Scouts on, like, on a basics, on, on a you know, first level understanding, having you know, what's the hash, what's the private key, what's the, um, what's the NFT, what's the, what's the wallet. And then we go into deeper. We go into uh, like, again, having these champions in, 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 um, in, inside of the community, looking into how um, what projects we could get in, uh, into, what projects we could do, what are the most relevant ones. I heard so many good ideas since I came here about what we can do in scouting. For example, uh, I, you mentioned we are decentralized. Yes, we have local scout groups everywhere in this neighborhood. Also, there is a scout group, actually. Um, and they, are in, they, they need some support in like creating a simple a treasury um, a treasury mechanism via blockchain, or um, you know, uh, they also like scouting is voluntary led, meaning that people are, are are voted for and elected to lead and and then to you know represent um, them yeah. in the other circles. So using DAO there and things like that. So I what I'm looking forward from this community is like ideas and uh, openness, maybe to suggest some things and help us actually do these things. Um, we are nonprofit and. Yeah, we're looking forward for anyone who want to partner uh, on a doing good basis and, and do something great together, solve some big problems. Awesome, yeah. awesome. I remember when I was a kid, I, was a, I used to be a scout, um, and I remember having different pins because of the different accomplishments or milestones. So now we are going to have pull-ups maybe, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's 25 more minutes here, and I, I believe that this is a good amount of time for opening uh, to, to the floor. Like anyone in the audience 
wants to, to pick the brains of these fellows and how they are planning to reach the next billion users? One sec, buddy. Hello, great to meet you all. Fantastic work you're doing. Um, uh, one of the thing, some of the things I heard is the use cases that you are all approaching are kind of existing use cases. Payments, smart contracts, um, maybe DIY or credentialing at least for scouts. Um, and, and so what it sounds like is like we've done well for these first billion with this use case. Let's push that to another billion. Um, Jeffrey, you mentioned gaming. Are there other use cases that you see as you look at different sort of populations? Um, or is it a matter of we've got some good use cases, we just need to reach more people? I'm just curious about your thoughts on a macro level on that stuff. Um, so I think the, so for me the way I look at this is that when I think of the next billion, um, uh, it's that I, I think different countries interact and learn about crypto in, in very different ways, right? So going back to the Kazakhstan uh, example, it was quite interesting because what happened in Kazakhstan was that China banned mining and all the miners fled to Kazakhstan. And then they were like, at first they panicked because, you know, they consume a lot of electricity. Kazakhstan, I think, went probably number one or number two hash rate in the world. And the government panicked and they, they overreacted and they kind of clamped down on it. And then after that, they said, hey, this is actually a very interesting industry. You know, we need to do more, or more about it, more in it. And then they started inviting uh, exchanges back into Kazakhstan, you know, Binance set up there, a bunch of other exchanges went in there and, and, and got established. Um, so I, I think it's, the way I look at it is too that um, we need new applications that provide benefit to people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think that the pool of people that we have not touched uh, is still very, very huge. Because you go in there and they, they are at the beginning of learning about this. Uh, most of them would still not have a MetaMask wallet. 25% um, of the population owns digital assets. Um, but you know, there is a lens and a process in which some of these countries learn about uh, crypto. And I think it's still a very, very early stage in terms of the 75% or 80% of each of these countries that you know, crypto has not touched yet. So to, to build on that and about the use cases, and this is more tapping into my experience uh, from the previous year being a, an Ethereum fellow, um, working with the public sector, typically they do, there's no one wanting to be the pioneer pioneer. They want to be the second pioneer, the third pioneer, but not the first one, right? Uh, so, so winning these small battles, having these different use cases is always super relevant. It's kind of a divide and conquer approach. It's like more on the, on the mindset of them. Uh, we started, for example, with uh, just verifiable credentials for commercial permits. That was a very simple thing. And then at some point, we started certifying city inspectors and policemen so that you were able to actually scan and see if that was an actual policeman and doing their, their job. And then we started into construction permits, and then we are now thinking about uh, legislation. Uh, there's actually a congresswoman here doing that thing. She's, she's in her WhatsApp right now, but... <laughs> No, she's, she's helping with the legislation right now, uh, but because of the use cases. So after we moved with around 50 different implementations, different flavors, just as the ones I've ju I just mentioned, we were able to start thinking about law initiatives. And after law initiatives, you can start thinking about how regulation can foster innovation, not block innovation. And then after that, we start stitching the ecosystem and saying, hey, can we have standards? Can we share the same thing when we talk about identity or public sector credentials or, or a sense of ownership of your digital assets? And then we are now integrating even with more Web3 services. So everything departed from the use cases and that ju this was just to highlight the relevance of your question. So thank you, Joffrey. Do you want to add on that? Yeah. Actually, just want to add a quick point. I think because you, you raised something very interesting in terms of how regulators think about this technology. Um, I think one of the part, I, I, one of my biggest fear is that uh, there is different use cases for Web3 in different countries, right? If I'm a small country, I might think differently. If I'm a big country, I want to regulate in a different way because I have different interests at stake. And what I see in this space is because most of them do not understand the technology and don't have access to the expertise, they will just copy the US most of the time. And the US chooses to regulate Web3 in a way because they have particular policy interests that doesn't, isn't the same shared interest as all those different countries. So definitely, there's, there's a snowball effect here. You, the more problems you find, the more business and impact opportunities you find as well. So any other question? Anyone wants to jump in? Do you want to hear? Hi, so 
Um, I was thinking, is there any way that uh, um, the Ethereum Foundation is documenting this kind of like growth, building blocks on how um, like uh, every single one of you have like, a different approach on how we can reach that next billion. Uh, so is there any kind of like documentation on how the, like, the growth building blocks are starting to merge with the patterns that you're discovering? Do you have any plans for sharing any of this kind of documentation? Do you have any plan to kind of keep it limited to knowledge right now? No, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, we have plans to look into, understand a little, little bit what, where, what's the, 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 the stage zero, where we are at the moment, and then to measure throughout this, the, the, the time of these projects, what's the impact made and, and what's the, like, what has changed from the zero. So for example, for my project, I'll be looking into where we are and scouting and as they, I'll be identifying some use cases. I will be identifying if someone is already working on it on the, on the national, local levels, I'll be identifying you know, the interest in that sense. And then on the end, I would also measure a little bit how that increased, for example, uh, over hopefully over the six months. I, I think, um, you know, this is an experiment in itself, right? I think we are figuring out uh, ourselves how do we best achieve the impact that we want. But I think the point you raised about sharing, I think is really, really crucial because what I notice with policymakers is that, or even banks, right? So we're trying to say, hey, banks, please bank people with crypto. And their first response is that, oh, it's very, very high risk. Can you point out to other people that are doing it so that we can have a sense that what we're doing is kosher? <laughs> and, and I think that sharing is just so important, right, when it comes to a policy process, because honestly, most policymakers and regulators are conservative. They don't want to stick their neck out, and they'll rather say, okay, you know, who else has done it? And then I can go back and explain to my stakeholders that I'm not trying to be too crazy here. Mary, you were saying about uh, building this uh, database or, or repository of the different flavors of regulations that we have. Uh, so are you planning to, to, to open source, to show it somehow? What are your plans on that? Yeah, absolutely, because I think that it will help companies when they're putting together projects and they write their terms and conditions. Like today, I think the only thing you can put in is that there is a risk that when you, if you die holding this account, you will lose everything that's in it. And I think once we get a little bit more knowledge about the different laws, it, it may end up being that we have three or four different variations based on where you're resident in the world. Because you know, not only where you're resident, where the asset is resident, and where the person dies, that those things all impact how, how property transfers. So yeah, it, it, the plan is definitely to make this open source and ultimately to create a standard of how, whatever our solution is, so that it's, you, it, it, so I, I have a vision in my head of it being something like an NFT standard where there's, there's one way of it's done and it, it works for all, all concerned. It would, it would be interesting and an and interesting do documentation challenge to, to think of six months and having your documenta do documentation for Web3 wheel kind of thing, right? It will be very interesting well, to that's, see that. That's the long-term vision. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. But that'll take a while because we have to go through law reform before yeah, we get there. Find a pattern, yeah. Uh, on a very practical, practical note on that, um, me being a, a, a fellow from the previous cohort, what we built was a different Notion sites. So everything is open. Uh, there is even a blog post at ethereum.org. You can go to the blog and you can see. You can actually go to my Twitter and you'll, you'll see the, the pinned tweet there. So we try to blog, we try to say videos, and, we, and, and particularly Notion work well as a tool to sharing different information. So that may, that may answer your question in a very practical approach. So, anyone else? Yes, please. Can yeah. Hey, Hassan from Brazil. So, thank you for like brainstorming for the adopting the next billion. One thing I, I believe we're all working here a lot for uh, incremental change. How we incrementally improve something we have between our hand. Um, like, we were working on the hackathon a couple of days ago, and there is one thing, for instance, the address, the wallet address, which is the very, very, very basic something for anybody coming to Ethereum or any crypto, you have to set up a wallet address for him. The wallet address by itself, whatever in Ethereum, which is hexadecimal or uh, in Bitcoin, it used a Latin character, which is already exclusive. There is 20, 30% of population they can't recognize the Latin character. You know, like, 
there is there is the ones they recognize the Latin character and hexadecimal for them is like extremely weird. But there is the ones they don't even recognize it. And that's already 1.5 billion of population we have today. So we worked, we actually won the um, prize on this part, the re, like presenting the wallet address on shape. Like instead of having it hexadecimal, like in the, the numbers one to 10, A, B, C, D, F, D, uh, we having it heart, square, which is shapes and colors, something kids could recognize and my grandma ca can. There is some stuff like very basic, I would say, is just like instead of us working incrementally to improve something exist, maybe we try to think about it again scratch from zero. It's just like how if this, if I don't have anything, how I would express this, how would I would do this if I don't have anything already exist? I just want to share this and and I appreciate really your work on the incremental, and I know as like as anybody working in a domain focus, you have to increment. But yeah, yeah how do you feel about like scratching something? It's like let's throw this all away and scratch some some <laughs> some brainstorm from zero. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. I'll try to reframe it a little bit, coming from the use cases and documentation approach. So this is somehow kind of a scaling question and, and particularly addressing the language barrier. Uh, as a Brazilian, there's always this thing that we have with like, hey, we have the Latin American gathering and everyone is speaking Spanish and it feels weird, right? Uh, so I've lived in Brazil for a couple of years and, and, and I know uh, where this comes from in a sense of language uh, and how it kind of becomes an extra challenge. For us also, uh, talking about blockchain, cadena de bloques doesn't sound that sexy. You, you want blockchain, right? Uh, so these kind of small steps that are on the language kind of barriers for scaling, do you have anything to share? Like, do you have a thought of any strategies? Can you, can you share anything? I'd love to share a little bit of that because I feel you touch on a very important issue about really how, how can it be more inclusive, the ecosystem? And I feel one part I've kind of, is a, is a huge long gripe of mine is how the UX itself is, can be exclusive. An example is that you know uh, I live in many places where the GDP per capita is under two, three thousand uh, dollars, so it's not very, very rich places. And when you make a mistake with your wallet on gas fees or anything, it's very expensive. You know, me losing three bucks if I'm in the U.S. because I made a mistake on my transaction is not a big problem. Me working with someone in Vietnam. Uh, who loses like three bucks or 10 bucks because they made some mistake on a transaction, that's a huge amount of money. Uh, and, and I think there needs to be ways to make the UX more inclusive. Um, I think what you're suggesting might be one direction, but just I think there's many, many of these little things that can be done to make it just a much more inclusive ecosystem. Yeah, I would like to add on this inclusivity is, is very important. It's a very good topic and very good uh, ideas out there. Don't think we should think of anything that we have so far and now as a set in stone, as a founding, founding things that we should never touch. Uh, that would put us on a very wrong step. We need to be criticizing and everything, which have a critical thinking over everything. Uh, maybe it worked but it, at some point, but it didn't thought of everything inclusively. Now, when we have this mind, when we have this conscious of that we were not inclusive, we should go back and be criticizing on any of the solutions that we have um, that are not inclusive. Uh, so I think that's very important to like be be open-minded to this and, and just like challenge everything that we have if it's if it's not inclusive enough. Nothing is secret in a way, secret and safe uh, in, and saint in that sense, not to be touched. So, yeah. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of my project, but I suspect that once we've gathered all the data, we're going to be jumping from, in most places, paper documents to some other form of solution. So, yeah, I think there is a possibility to rewrite the whole, how the process is done, as long as we work within the legal framework to do that. So, yeah. Coming back to, to, to the original um, approach about language, uh, our white paper was written in Spanish, Spanish first, and it has been a, a, a quite challenge because most of the people want to read it in English, but we want to reach much, most of uh, people Spanish speaking. So it is like, no, 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 it was written for you. But no, 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 but I want to read your white paper in English. No, 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 but it was written for Spanish. So, so yeah, I, I, I feel that challenge a lot. Um, so we have 10 more minutes, and I would love for them to have also some kind of uh, uh, closing remarks. So maybe we have a room for one or two questions. So there's one person over there, please.
Hi, uh, I'm Maggie. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, talking on this panel. So my question is actually about building trust. So um, how do you actually build trust within the audiences that you serve? Um, because I think Ethereum for the next billion is a really big topic that all of us are um, looking to work towards. But I think like on the other side, for people that don't know about Ethereum or people that are end users, um, what are some of the challenges um, for building trust within these communities? And what are some of the things that you're doing already to do that? I, I love that question, particularly because from the different audiences that you're addressing, these next billion people, they feel scared when they think about Bitcoin. They feel Ponzi schemes, they feel scams, they feel all these things that we were discussing before. So please jump and, and can we have our 20 minutes, please? <laughs> <laughs> sure. If I, if I may, just like, I think we just need to be, stay more open and show what the good things are we doing and what we want to, to do and like, that there is that it's not about making a personal gain and it's not about the Ethereum, it's not about that. It's so much about solving the real, real, uh, real problems. I guarantee you people who are not in this room or not in the Ethereum community have no clue about that. And just finding ways, how do we bring that? So bring them on, talk to your friends, advocate, bring them together, you know, organize talks and, and, and disclose all of this. Talk about, you know, instead of them asking you, so what about this is about the cryptocurrencies you can make? Some? No, no, no. Let me explain you what this is about, actually, and what, is, what it does. So, like, go, go into that, I think, going into this, um, being more open and being, you know, like taking off the hoodie and <laughs> showing that we are, we are human and we are people and, and we want to, you know, uh, be open, not just like a closed little uh, room that you can't access, actually unless you are part of the community. I think we were just chatting before this session about our expectations pre-DEFCON and in DEFCON. Um, and I remember you said like, oh, you know, I thought people would be lining up outside with the Ferraris and the conversation all about Lumbo, Lumbo, Lumbo. Um, and I think it's a very different vibe we actually got coming down here. And I think, uh, you know, one thing I feel is like regulators and policymakers, that is their impression of the community. Uh, and if, they, if more of them come to this event, I think they would understand it a lot better. And I think that's something that uh, you know, has to be done uh, to build that trust where they actually see, hear, and interact uh, with the community to understand the values of this community. And I think to add to that, I think our, our style of communication, I think we need to remember that our audience doesn't come with the backgrounds that we have. And that we, if we can, I like to, I like to bridge things. So it's like something you're doing already, but it's a little bit different so that they're not completely intimidated by what it is we're doing. Um, and then to perhaps touch a slightly controversial nerve, we were talking about this earlier, I think we need to self-regulate. I think that when we have incidents in the community that are not good, we need to be seen to be disapproving of those incidents because if you look at what mainstream media tends to cover, it's things like hacks or exploits of some sort, and that doesn't make us look good. Yeah, there, there is a lot of uh, to, to build on, on self-regulating this community. As, as Geoffrey was asking, when he said, like, is there any regu regulator here? No one raised a hand. So there's, this means that there's people making rules for how we should operate or build in the Ethereum ecosystem, that they are not in this room, that they are not feeling this vibe. So it is our responsibility to bring them here and, f and f also for us to visit them and to share and to grab this next billion. Uh, is there any other question? Yeah, sorry, just to, add, to be open-minded with that, you know, yeah. to understand like where they're coming from and what their pain problem points are, problems are, and how do we navigate through that instead of being angry on them. You know, uh, we have a tendency when we hear from them like, we will forbid this is not going to work, and it's never, and you're like, no, you are stupid. No, you yeah. should just turn this different, like different, really be be what we are, a good people, open-minded, open heart, like with a with a clean heart. So come yeah. into that talks with a clean, yeah. with, you know open-mindedness and, and, and um, you know, good intentions and also good, uh, like, good, good heart, you know? Yeah, this, this is also why I love the graphic, principle, graphic design principles on Web3. If I jump with this shirt into any political party, they don't know who I'm rooting for. <laughs> so I, I'm as inclusive as possible, right? So this is kind of the message to bring the next billion, to, to show every single color and bring them. Uh, any other question? Well, there's probably one minute, one minute and a half. I would love for you to share any closing remarks, hopefully optimistic on how the Ethereum ecosystem can positively impact the life of the next billion uh, and how people can reach you. Yeah, sure, I can do. Uh, I can start. I think we just need to stay humble, but then on the other hand, uh, be more open, op uh, help, 
help others look for you know one we, once we solve one problem look for another problem we can solve there are so many problems in this world but uh, and and maybe we cannot solve them all but we can solve a lot so um, that's a big t task to do and if we are oriented always to that to look into how we solve some of the real real problems then um, then we will stay on a good path and it will be recognized better it will be be more and more seen as, as someone who is uh, uh, who is part of the solution rather than part of the problem and we need to prove that no, no, we're not doing that not only to prove that as we know we're doing that for for a good reasons for the good cause but just staying with this good cause always uh, and this value system uh, would be very important I think um, thank closing death and the transfer of assets is a is a challenging expensive complicated problem and I think once we get a baseline of what rules apply to it, I know that the, the Ethereum community has to create a solution. And I'm, I'm counting on the, the development teams in the, in the room to help with this because we will, be, we will be sparing people heartache and we'll be sparing them cost and complication. And for a lot of folks, it's a legal process and they don't have access to lawyers. And if we can make it something that is done automatically and driven by the holder of the asset, I think we can improve people's lives. Yeah, I, I think the one word that really stands out for me um, is inclusiveness. Um, and I think the way I see it is that, you know, we should be thinking about who should be a part of this conversation, but is not a current part of the conversation. Uh, so I think for me, you know, my, my thought is that I'm going to have a bring, bring a policymaker, bring a regulator to an event uh, mindset, I think in the future, where, you know, if they are not, you know, they are dealing with these issues, but they are not part of this conversation, part of this community, or part of the, the, the environment here. Uh, it's, it's something, a burden that I should t take to make sure that you know, they are able to come here and participate in all of these things. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to close with sharing exper an experience that I had a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, I was in a, in a global government summit. Um, actually, it was an open government partnership uh, summit in Ottawa in Canada. Uh, and to my surprise, I, wa I was feeling like the only technologist there. And to my surprise, one of the uh, first conversations at, at, in the stage was Tim Berners-Lee. So he was sharing all his thoughts on how he envisioned the internet and how he's thinking the web tree will look like, or the next internet, or the next web. Uh, and when he stepped down of the, of the scenario, he said like, hey, you know, probably, probably you and me are the only technologists here. Like, what brought you here? Do you actually think that the Web3 or the next internet is going to be better? And he said, just like the internet, the Web3 is like a sidewalk. There's going to be good people and bad people walking through it. So that's the message. Use it well. Bring the next billion for positively impacting the lives of the many. Thank you. Thank you.